from WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington. Welcome to the Kojo Nandi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. Later in the broadcast, author Paul Dixon rules for life, the official rules, like Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will. But first, an impressive array of world leaders praised the incredible life and legacy of former South African President Nelson Mandela at a memorial service in Johannesburg last weekend, but it's the sign language interpreter standing just a few feet from President Obama and other dignitaries at the podium that everyone is still talking about. The man was apparently a fraud moving his hands in signs that were not recognizable in any of the world's many sign languages. He later said that he suffers from schizophrenia and heard voices in his head during the service. His bizarre story raises serious concerns about security and how he ended up at center stage at such a momentous event, but it also raises questions about how interpreters for the deaf are trained and certified and the need for skilled sign language interpreters around the world. Joining me to talk about sign language interpreting is Melanie Metzger. She is chair of the Department of Interpretation at Gallaudet University here in Washington, D.C. Melanie Metzger is going to communicate in American Sign Language, which you can watch on a live video stream on our website, kojoshow.org. You can also follow a live captioning of this discussion on our website. The voice you hear interpreting for Melanie is that of Carolyn Ressler from Gallaudet Interpreting Service. Melanie Metzger, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You too can join this conversation. Call us at 800-433-8850. Do you know American Sign Language or International Sign Language? Give us a call, 800 800- 433-8850. Have you worked as a sign language interpreter? You can also send email to kojo at wamu.org or send us a tweet at Kojo Show. Melanie Metzko, what should the South African interpreter have been doing? Which sign language should he have been translating into at an event like the memorial service that was being watched around the world? Well, I guess that would depend. I mean, obviously, one of the options would be for him to use South African Sign Language. But in addition to that, sometimes at international events, as this was, they will use international sign. So either one of those options would have been acceptable. A third option might be to have several interpreters available, each of them using their native indigenous sign languages. So that would have been what the conference organizers would have stipulated for that kind of an event. Can you describe international sign language and how it differs from American sign language? Well, you know, every country has an indigenous natural sign language that's true for that particular country. There may be one or two or more than that, actually, in each country. But often sign languages have certain features, linguistic features, that are shared amongst different sign languages. And this is also true with spoken languages. There are language families, if you will. So those linguistic features are put together and agreed upon and shared lexicons or signs are used to create an international way of communicating with individuals so that many signers from around the world are able to communicate with one another. It is my understanding that American Sign Language has more in common with French Sign Language than with British Sign Language. Why is that? Well, actually, Sign Language was developed through the history of the deaf community. And that being the case, it just so happened that in the United States here, Someone from the United States actually traveled to France and was able to understand their model of teaching deaf children and brought that teaching pedagogy back to the United States. And as a result, those two languages influenced one another. 800-433-8850 is the number to call. You can also send us a tweet at Kojo Show. Have you ever held an event where you needed a sign language interpreter? How did you find that interpreter? You can also go to our website, kojoshow.org ask a question or make a comment there. The phone number again, 800-433-8850. We're talking with Melanie Metzger. She is chair of the Department of Interpretation at Gal- Gallaudet University. Here in the United States, what does it take to become a professional sign language interpreter? How are interpreters trained? How are they certified? Well, there are two parts to that answer. 
first there's the instruction of teaching an individual to become an interpreter, that's the educational component, but there's also the assessment that's required to determine if a person is able to be certified. In the educational end of things, we offer different types of degrees and different levels of degrees. Here at Gallaudet University, we offer a BA degree, which is a four-year degree in sign language interpreting. We also offer a master's degree in that same subject matter. And both of these programs teach individuals who are already fluent in American Sign Language how it is they are to understand the cognitive processes and the work that's required mentally and the social interaction uh, requirements to allow for professional interpreting to happen. You also offer a PhD in sign language interpretation. What would that entail? Right. Actually, we have offered the very first doctoral program in sign language interpreting in the world at Gallaudet University. And in this particular program, there are three options for our students. We can look more at the research to help ourselves better understand the multiple issues as they relate to sign language interpreting. In addition, we prepare interpreters in teaching interpretation or interpreter pedagogy. And thirdly, people are able to combine both of those two earlier aspects and create a program. The doctoral program requires individuals to have already been certified and already having experience as a working interpreter. Can you describe the three areas you teach each of your students from what happens in your brain when you listen to one language and translate into another to the protocols of making logistical arrangements for interpreting? Sure, absolutely. The process of interpreting on a cognitive level is quite complex. So when someone's actually interpreting between any two languages, be they spoken languages or sign language, it does require that an individual is able to take in that source message and fully comprehend its meaning, and then in the, the way of processing it, able to create meaning in that target language and express that meaning. So that's the first step that we do in our program is to teach students how to better understand what language means and how you manipulate that language to get to the meaning of it, and then how you separate two languages and create meaning from one language to the other language. And that's the process of the interpreters learning to translate those languages, and that does take time. We have the students first come to an understanding of how to conceptually translate meaning in a consecutive fashion from one language to another. So someone might be using spoken language or sign language, and then after a short period of time, they're asked to pause while the interpretation thinks over the meaning and then is able to produce that interpretation. The process of consecutive interpreting is to seem to be the most accurate, but of course, in the world we live in today, simultaneous interpreting is much more desired. And in that case, interpreters have to have the skill to take in that source message, understand the meeting, and simultaneously produce a target message, having the same equivalent message. It's very complex, but there are, of course, issues of messages, information being deleted, just because of the cognitive process being as complex as it is. So this being the case, our program really teaches students to better understand the cognitive processes and that's one of the skills that we work with our students on developing and then there's the social process that comes to interpreting you know anytime you talk about language language has occurs in different specific situations uh, be they medical situations or legal situations mental health arenas business arenas government education and a variety of other settings our guest is Melanie Metzger. She is chair of the Department of Interpretation at Gallaudet University. She's communicating in American Sign Language. You can watch on a live video stream on our website, kojoshow.org. You can also follow a live captioning of this discussion on our website. The voice you hear interpreting for Melanie is that of Carolyn Ressler from Gallaudet Interpreting Service. You can also call with your questions or comments, 800 Four three three eight eight five zero. How important do you think it is for sign language interpreters to be certified? Eight hundred four three three eight eight five zero. Or you can send email to kojo at wamu.org. Melanie Metzger, what was your reaction and the reaction on campus at Gallaudet to the interpreter at the Mandela Memorial? Well, you know, that's a very good question. I think there were different layers of experience that people had in terms of their reaction. First one being that of outrage, that it's such an important international event that deaf people, of course, wanted access to be able to understand what was happening. Nelson Mandela was a staunch supporter of the deaf community in South Africa and, of course, a human rights uh, proponent throughout the world. And so there were some comments as well that it was 
understood that in that particular situation at the memorial service, this has brought worldwide attention to the issue of sign language interpreting and communication rights that come from that for people who are deaf in the deaf community. So that's an issue that's often overlooked, so bringing highlight and attention to that issue and understanding how it impacted a number of deaf people was seen positively. People around the world who are deaf face this issue of having unqualified interpreters in their doctor's offices and their schools, and sometimes they've endured this for a number of years, as well as in their places of employment or the courthouse. So these kinds of situations impact people's daily lives. They can be life or death situations. I mean, think about the educational development that happens in a school setting and how critical it is in terms of a human rights issue to have qualified interpreters. So in that sense, it's a good thing to actually bring worldwide attention to the issue of sign language interpreters and qualities. And that's an issue that's often overlooked. Often overlooked because of this incident in South Africa, a lot of people I know who are deaf or people who have deaf friends said their deaf friends told them that they would be surprised at how often this occurs. And what you seem to be saying is that incident brings that reality to the attention of the hearing world. Yes, exactly. You know, to have a qualified interpreter at that particular event or in the lives of people on a daily basis really comes down to three issues. One relates to the education of sign language interpreters as I've mentioned and there are academic programs throughout the United States and around the world that address the educational component. Secondly, you know, they have the ability to analyze a person's skill and assess as to whether or not they have the qualifications and they have the professional ethics to function in that capacity is another component. Thirdly, you have to satisfy the you know, hiring criteria and all three of those components are very important. So you might have skilled interpreters and you may also have interpreters who are certified, but if those individuals who are hiring agencies are not hiring those qualified skilled interpreters, then communication access is still a barrier. Um, you have said interpreters often translate from their second language into their first. Can you explain that and explain why it's preferable? Well, that's often true if you look at spoken language interpreters as well as sign language interpreters. So if you have options to interpret your L2, your second language, to your first language, your L1, that language that you're most fluent in is the language that you would typically want to express your interpretation in because that's the most natural use of your language. Going from your second language to your first language is preferable. Not that that always happens, it's not always required, but nonetheless people do have a preference towards working in that direction of language interpretation. Why is there a growing trend to work with deaf translators and deaf interpreters and how does it work? Well, one reason for this growing trend is because deaf individuals have been raised using American Sign Language as their native language, their L1 language. And so that being the case, deaf interpreters are working in a variety of different settings, including international settings, international types of arenas, sometimes working from one particular indigenous sign language into international sign language or from international sign language into a specific language of sign language. Also there are deaf blind individuals who want to be able to have access to a visual language and they do that through the use of either closed vision or tactile interpreting that's provided by a deaf interpreter. And there are also uh, individuals who will work with hearing interpreters and they will actually get the source message fed to them through a hearing interpreter who is seated in the audience and the deaf interpreter stands on stage and gets the message fed to them in American Sign Language and they reproduce that for the audience. So there are a number of ways that deaf interpreters are used. Sometimes they also work from a frozen text where they actually take a text that's in a written language and express it in a sign language. So there's a number of ways that deaf interpreters work in the area of translating and interpreting. Are there any international norms for certification? Because I think what bothered me most about what I saw in South Africa was that we had no information after the event about how this individual was vetted, how this individual was certified, and how this individual was chosen. Are there any international norms for certification? Well, I think we're talking here about a couple of different things. Certification is one of those things and the other is actually the hiring of interpreters and that's a little bit different from certification. When it comes to certification, there is no international certifying body. There is an organization called WASLI and that's the World Association of Sign Language Interpreters. Uh, that association actually works to promote uh, international use of professional sign language interpreters around the world. But generally speaking right now, even here in the United States, 
we have a national organization, which is the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, RID, and that association provides a certification exam for interpreters. Some states actually offer an examination to assess an interpreter's skills and qualifications. In addition, agencies, individual agencies, will offer screening tests as well to vet their interpreters before hire. So there are a number of uh, ways that we can evaluate interpreter skills even after they've completed their preparation, their education and study. The, there's then a separate issue of actually going about hiring uh, working interpreters and that probably is perhaps the most challenging issue of, of this whole issue because often hiring agencies are not qualified assessors of interpreting, they're not involved in the deaf community, they don't know the sign language and so those individuals have to make sure they have connections with people who do know how to go about finding a qualified interpreter, a certified interpreter to ensure that quality interpretation is provided. We had a caller, Jeannie, who couldn't stay on the line, who wants to know why is it called interpretation and not translation? Well, actually, when you think of the word translation, and this is particular to our field of study, when you think about a translation, you're thinking about working between two languages in translation. You're working from a frozen text, something that's in written form, to another kind of frozen text or written text form. And that's how we describe it in the field of interpretation. Translation is something that you actually are given sufficient time to read and research, get resources to better understand the text as it's written and then produce a similarly written interpretation in a different language. Interpretation, however, acts uh, when we're working with individuals, either face-to-face -face communication or we may be using technologies, video phones, and that sort of thing to provide um, interpretation between two languages. There are less, there's less time involved. Uh, it's actually can be done in a consecutive or simultaneous way. So that's the best way to describe it. Let's go to the phones and talk with Laura in Silver Spring, Maryland. Laura, you are on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Kojo. Thank you very much for taking my call. I want to bring up something that a lot of people aren't familiar with. It's called cued speech. It's spelled C-U-E-D. I have a son that um, is deaf, born deaf, and has a cochlear implant. And it's one of the modalities that we've found that is most helpful in allowing him access to language on top of what his implant gives him. And this is something that um, it's familiar in this area, but in other areas of the country, and I'd like to, um, to have people's opinions or just talk about your familiarity well, with cute speech. We can certainly get Melanie Metzger's opinion about it. Melanie Metzger? Well, cueing is something very different from using a natural sign language. So if someone invents some kind of a hand shape and combines that with a uh, lip movement, that allows you to show the way that the uh, spoken language can be reduced in a visual form. And it's suggested at some time in the past that this might be equivalent to providing language access to individuals who are deaf. Um, when you're working with someone who's translating from cued speech to a spoken language, it's a very different process that takes place in your brain because you're processing um, more on a phonological level and you're providing a translation and in that level. So it's a bit different from looking at an interpretation where you're using a visual language, American Sign Language, and you're using what we call more of a translation, or rather a transliteration between that language and another. Melanie Metzger is Chair of the Department of Interpretation at Gallaudet University. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you very much. The voice you heard interpreting for Melanie is that of Carolyn Ressler from Gallaudet Interpreting Service. Carolyn Ressler, thank you for joining us. Sure. And our thanks, of course, go out to the Speech Communications and Speech.com for providing the live captioning for our conversation today. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, author Paul Dixon, Rules for Life, the official rules like Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will. I'm Kojo Namdi.